um, go for it. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. So, uh, welcome. My name is Samantha. I think I pretty much know everybody that's here. It's always good to see so many familiar faces. Um, I am the Community and Adult Services Librarian here. Um, so welcome to our Spring 2023 series. This is our 42nd year of Book Sandwiched In, which is very exciting. Um, I would like to thank our friends of the library. They do sponsor this program. They purchase all of our refreshments and our door prizes and all of those things. So we are very grateful to our friends. Um, so this year, we decided to start with a committee review program. Um, our committee has changed a little bit over the last couple of years, so we thought it would be nice to meet everybody. Um, Richard's still here, but you know, yeah, I, I, <laughs> he's not allowed to go anywhere. So, um, so each uh, each committee member is going to share one or two reviews, um, questions as we go. If you have a question, feel free to ask. Um, and I will turn it over to our first speaker, who is Richard. Maybe not. You're not going to hold it like you did no, last year. Oh, okay. good. Okay. That was that didn't work out. looking at me going, oh my god. All right, so before I get into that, uh, a little bit about Book Sandwiched In. You guys have I've asked a few people how long have you been coming, and obviously, I don't think we have anybody from 81. Perhaps I know Samantha said I wasn't even born yet. So that's, a, that's a long, long time. Uh, it's been a great program. I've been involved with it for about 15 years myself. Um, I ran into a uh, senior moment. Um, so anyway, I, I, Samantha is uh, privy to a spreadsheet with all of the reviewers and books reviewed. I was looking through it, um, just thumbing through it. I came across a name of uh, a woman who uh, I, I don't know, but I know her husband. And she reviewed a book in 1984 called um, Walter and Harriet Love Affair, I believe, something along those lines. His wife uh, passed on a few years back and he married again. But it's just interesting. The, the history of, of Book Sandwich Inn has involved so many different uh, folks in the community. Uh, um, I saw, said to Samantha that uh, Barbara Connable, our, uh, our congressman, and at the time I think that he came here four times, believe it or not, a, a dignitary like that came in and spoke in front of this group. Four times, I think, while he was a World Bank president. So, wow, that's pretty cool. All right, um, the book, Louise Blanchard Bethune. Bethune. Uh, anybody ever heard of her? We have one. <laughs> You'll, I'll get to you. I'll get to you. Um, no? Anybody ever heard of the Lafayette Hotel in Buffalo? Ah, more heads on. All right, well. Uh, this book is entitled Louis, Louise Blanchard Bethune, Every Woman Her Own Architect. Um, Brian and I were lucky enough to, to take part in the, uh, the book launch about what, three weeks ago at the Lafayette Hotel. Uh, the author, uh, Kelly Hayes McLoney. <coughs> I was impressed, so impressed with the number of literary people that came out by 75 to 100 people inside of the coffee shop there in the Lafayette Hotel for her book. And a great, great presenter gave me a real good feel for you know, the book I was about to read. So I was glad that I selected it and I stuck with it. Uh, excellent book that gives you terrific information on not just architecture and not just um, you know her life, but also about the times that she lived in and how difficult life was for a woman. I mean, I, of course, everyone knows this. You, you learned it as you've grown up, but wow. Just the things that women weren't allowed to do by society's convention. And uh, Louise uh, was an early uh, 
pioneer, I guess you could say, uh, in the cause of women developing a professional life and uh, being out in public in, in, in not the approved dress of the day, shall we say, uh, doing things that are not uh, something that a woman would do. Uh, she was, uh, actually, I didn't bring my sheet, but I did bring the book. This is pretty cool. Uh, she, her family moved to Buffalo in the 1850s. Uh, she graduated from, um, from Buffalo Central High School in 1874 and then spent an extra year uh, going on to college prep. She was planning on going to Cornell, but uh, she, at an early age, she had identified architecture as what she wanted to study, what she wanted to be was an architect, which there were no uh, women architects at that point. Uh, well, she managed to get a job with an architectural firm in Buffalo that, uh, by the gentleman by the name of Richard Waite. Uh, not sure of any famous buildings that he's designed in Buffalo, but he was a very prominent uh, architect with a large staff, and he took her under his arm, and uh, she was an avid student, and moved up through the company. And of course, this is before architecture had uh, any sort of uh, formal process to become an architect. You basically were an apprentice. You studied underneath an architect. Once you established yourself with that architect, you would start to do more and more for the firm. Well, she did more and more with the firm. And by 1881, I think it was just the five years she was with Wade, uh, she left the company, formed her own company, and was Louise, Luthay, or, yeah, Louise Blanchard. And shortly thereafter, she married Robert uh, Luthay. I hate that name. Bethune. <laughs> and Robert Bethune worked with her at Waite. They married, they formed a company with a third gentleman, which I don't have the name off the top of my head. And they practiced architecture from about 18, well, from 1881 uh, until she died in 1913. Uh, she, McLoney does a terrific job on, on research. I mean, this is one of the problems with, with doing a book like this is that um, Louise was not someone who kept a diary, not a lot of uh, personal correspondence, things like that. So a lot of it was taken from, from uh, newspaper interviews, from uh, reports that she had uh, uh, you know, was written up in either the New York Times or uh, various other publications. So i got to get to this one page. Now bear with me, and, you know, uh, how could he forget his paper? It's coming, don't worry. I know you're worried. Well, I'm not going to find this on um, In, in uh, anybody remember 2012? Remember when uh, uh, Tom Brady dissed Buffalo? <laughs> yes, he said there was no quality hotels in which to stay in Buffalo. Well, I, I, you know, I take issue with that. I took issue with it at the time. Um, so, the Lafayette Hotel in 1904, when it was opened, designed by uh, by Louise, uh, she was the architect that not only designed it on the boards, she went out to the site, she climbed rafters, she did all the things that an architect of that time did, which was unheard of, of course, for a woman at, at that time in, 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 in the world. So she completely designed it, helped build it, and the hotel was lauded in the New York Times as one of, as one of the finest establishments in the, in the whole entire country. So uh, it, it draws new notice from around the world. Uh, Elizabeth, or excuse me, Louise also earlier in her career pushed for uh, registration. She became a member of both the Western Architects Association and the uh, American Institute of Architects. Uh, the coolest thing she did, though, I think, was she was the first woman to buy a bicycle in Buffalo. Now imagine, and this is not those crazy bikes with the wheels that are up high. These are the standard, what they call, safety bikes. Of course, it had a, the bar that would allow a woman to wear, you know, all the crazy clothes, girdles, and you know, pleated skirts, and all this. I, I, I can't, I can't imagine. But she altered those clothing. Uh, she formed a bicycle club all kinds of uh, interactions with other groups in, in Buffalo, became a professional woman, accepted in the city, um, really you know, brought the cause of architecture and women's uh, liberation to the forefront. Uh, McLoney does a very, very good job of, of 
writing this, um, let's say definitely a feminist viewpoint, shall we say. And even though the word feminist was not even uh, accepted in the vernacular until probably around 1904, 05. This is before that, as that era progressed. So it's a very good book. Uh, I guess a word of caution would be it's, it's pretty dense with a lot of arcane history, so I'm, shall we say. A lot of detail. I did skim in a few parts, but I, I'm going to go back and reread it. So I would, you know, recommend it. I know I had, how many of you were at the Lafayette Tap Room with me? I'm surprised there's no more of us. No? You're, Francis, you're at. Well, <laughs> in uh, whatever year that was. What's the name of your club? The Wednesday Study Club. The Wednesday Study Club. I gave them a tour at the Martin House. And this is the only time, only time that I've ever received any sort of gratuity. They took me to lunch at the Lafayette Hotel. <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> and when you go to visit the Lafayette Hotel, make sure you look at the building next door. That is the Brisbane Building. The Brisbane building was built by the grandson of James Brisbane, one of the early settlers here in Buffalo, or in Batavia. So check those out and I'll shut up. I do apologize. I had a great, great school. <laughs> go home and read it to the cats. So. Right. And next up, who do we have? Richard. Christina. Oh. Richard? Yes. Oh, I am. Can you ask me a question? Just a quick comment. Sure. Exactly. Thank you very much. Yes, she she made a, a, a rather, uh, I, I guess, strong stand. She was uh, asked to submit a design for the uh, Pan American Exposition, not the Pan American, the, the exposition in Chicago in 1893, and she turned it down because they were going to pay the woman one tenth of the salary or the one tenth of the amount that a man would have gotten for the same design. So. And she did that a number of times through her career. She would not accept pro, pro bono work. Said, no, my work, I get paid. She, she was very successful. Thank you for bringing that up. Anybody else? No? All right. So definitely check out the, the Hotel Lafia. Uh, Rocco Termini did an excellent job of restoring it and, and bringing it into the 21st century. So passing it on, I can give you a little introduction about myself. So my name is Christina Mortalero Frank. Uh, I am actually a native Batavian. So I grew up in Batavia. I went to Batavia public schools all through, you know, K through 12. Um, I moved back to the area after college. I currently work at SUNY Genesee Community College. I'm their, their director of their TRIO Adult Educational Opportunity Center, long title. But essentially what I do is I help adults in uh, not just Genesee County, but six different counties in Western New York access education. And they may be low income or first generation or vets or children of vets. So that, that's my gig when I am at the college is I'm working with adults trying to access either college or trades and all of that great stuff. So um, I'm really happy to be part of the Book Sandwiched In Committee because it was definitely something that I had seen growing up and never could attend because I'd be in school. But I had always seen it just out and about, at least, you know, floating around. I also was an avid Richmond Memorial Library card holder, had my first card at five years old with my little print. It is still at home. <laughs> and. Um, it's like gray with some purple writing. So I try to keep all of my cards. Um, so I'm really happy to be part of the committee, which I joined last, last spring. So for today, I am talking about Chasing the Boogeyman by Richard Chismar. So uh, first to let you know, I read this book back in January 2022. 
So I read it because I had seen a lot of different reviews for some upcoming like indie picks. I had studied English when I was an undergrad and so I wanted to stay on top of you know, different types of independent publishers uh, because that was something I felt very passionate about. And I also got into this kick where I was reading a lot of horror fiction. I don't know why, it was just the time period I was in. I like to read all different types of books. Um, I especially love nonfiction, especially memoir. And so I had this you know, love of memoir, this interest in horror all of a sudden, and this book combined both of it, both of those elements. So it's actually a book that is, um, it's not just thriller and suspense, but it is also, it is fiction, it's a novel but there are elements of truth, of memoir, in the book as well. So that's what was really interesting about this, going in and thinking, okay, there's gonna be this story, and I'm not gonna know what's true and what's not true. It's also, it was written in the true crime fashion, so you have it in a first person perspective of, I'm doing this, I'm researching this, but it's still very personal, like a memoir in terms of returning to his hometown, growing up, um, being able to come back after graduating from college, all these things that felt very personal to me. But on top of it, there were a series of grisly murders, which, um, which is very, very fortunate to have not happened in Batavia. <laughs> so um, it was a, it, the idea had interested me, and that's when I had approached the book. Um, I went and got it at a bookstore, and the rest is history. I read it in about like five hours. Honestly, it was something that I couldn't put down. I, I picked up one night in you know January and I read like a couple of chapters and it was a little slow going. And then Saturday night hit, Saturday afternoon hit, and then you know my husband wanted to watch something on TV and I said, no, I actually want to read this all night, <laughs> which I hadn't wanted to do that in a long time. So to have a writer get write something so engaging was something that I hadn't experienced in a really long time. And you know, not everyone's gonna have the same reaction when they read it, but I think for me it hit at the right time. You know, the right time, place, and my personal perspective coming back and coming back home. So the concept of the book is that it's the summer of 1988, and the writer Richard Chismar, he is the character in the book, and he's returning home to his hometown in Edgewood, Maryland, which is a real location, and he is getting ready to get married. So he's engaged to you know, his lovely fiance, he's an aspiring writer, uh, he studied journalism, and he also had a penchant for like horror fiction and writing horror and writing like suspense and science fiction and all that. So he returns home, he's preparing to move on to this next chapter in his life. And then during that summer, there's a series of disappearances of these local girls. And not only just disappearances, but they also find, unfortunately, their, their mutilated bodies. So there's this idea that there's this murder that's happening, the, the series of murders, is it a serial killer? The whole town is on edge. Sometime, you know, it's a town that's very quiet and peaceful and close-knit. There was always, um, in his words, a, a wrong side of the track, so to speak, but it, it wasn't anything that was um, overtly a danger to everyone. But all of a sudden you have people getting snatched out of their homes, people getting snatched out of their driveways. You don't know what's happening. And so it was very scary in the, in the story. Um, and so he becomes, well, the, the rumors spread that this killer might be sort of paranormal because you just don't know how is this killer doing what he or she is doing, you know. Um, even though the police and the FBI that gets involved, they, they do believe that this is a real madman and based on the local presence and the targeting of a specific population, that it's a local member of their community. So, you know, there's all these different events that are set up in the book in terms of like curfews and you know if the, the advisements from the police to you know keep your doors locked keep your windows locked and yet these things keep happening so Richard because he wants to be an, uh, an aspiring writer he gets involved and in starts starting to write about the series of the murders and then he gets involved with the investigation himself 
um, not really like the police want him to be. They don't really want him to be involved at all, but <laughs> he is. And um, the serial killer also taunts the police and you know taunts the the writer himself throughout the book too, where you get like like the Zodiac killer vibes in terms of the messages being sent and on, on the, in the publication. So his life is forever changed because he becomes obsessed with this mystery as he's trying to navigate this next part of his adulthood. So like I said, this is a very engrossing book for myself. Um, I, I do like true crime, but I'm not a true crime aficionado. Like there's some folks who just devour it. They listen to all the podcasts about true crime. They read all the true crime books. I find it a bit grisly for my taste, um, but I really liked, like I said, how it combined the elements of memoir with his life, with the elements of true crime writing. Uh, so if you ever read like Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, it's very much like that in terms of humanizing the people who are involved. Um, there's also a lot of elements of like Stand By Me by Stephen King because likewise he's, you know, returning home and it's instead of, he's not discovering the bodies like the, the kids do in the book, but the style is very similar. Um, what's really interesting is that Richard Chismar actually co-wrote a book with Stephen King. He co-wrote uh, Wendy's Button Box, I believe. I haven't read it. Uh, Richard Chismar has had a very like storied career in terms of writing short stories and novellas. Um, he has a, a small horror lit publication called Cemetery Dance that he started while he was in college. It's mentioned in the book. Um, and that publication has grown so it's not just a magazine, but it's also a website that publishes ebooks and um, it's a, a small publishing press essentially now. So he co wrote with Stephen King. Stephen King had a bunch of stories that he just never finished. Uh, his, their agents, they got them connected, they have talked with each other, and um, he said, you know, have at it, look at the story, I've never finished it. So Richard, you know, he looked at the story and came up with an ending that Stephen King found suitable, I suppose, and then they co-wrote the book together, and they're going to work on um, co-writing the third part of the trilogy, I believe. And um, something that's really great about this book, I thought that Chasing the Boogeyman, which Ch Richard Chismark completely wrote by himself, I thought it was a bit open-ended for what I thought would be like true crime. Um, he meant that on purpose because it turns out there will be a sequel coming out this October. So mm -hmm. it's going to be called Becoming the Boogeyman, and it's supposed to take place two years after the publication of this book, which if this was published in 2021, it's supposed to take place in 2023. So my word of advice when it comes to actually reading the book is to not look up anything before going into reading it. There's going to be pictures in the book, nothing gruesome, but pictures of houses, pictures of people, and you, you don't want to lose your, I think you want to be immersed into it and try to say, you know, completely, um, I keep saying immersed, but immersed in the book and the story, and then see for yourself if you can tell the fact from the fiction. Because I think that was the really fun part about this for me. Midway through the book, I was like, this this can't be real, or something couldn't be real. And I looked up something, and I sort of spoiled it for myself. Um, I will tell you, there, there are true elements of this, but it is still a work of fiction. So go into it understanding that it is a work of fiction with truth in it and see if you have the same experience as me maybe devouring it in one sitting so thank you and if you have any questions i will answer them all right okay yes is there a solution at the end there, there is a, a solution, a resolution that happens, um, and you see it in the epilogue, which is why I was confused as to why there would be a sequel. But there were elements in the epilogue that you didn't get answers to that I thought, well, this was a major part. How come this wasn't addressed? The writer said it wasn't addressed in, uh, for certain reasons, essentially mimicking how in life you don't always have the answers to everything. Um, but I guess it was also his way to have an opening for a sequel, which was very strategic on his end. <laughs> oh, you and then you. Just a quick one. Um, did 
happened in the summer of 88? Is that when he graduated in that time frame? Yeah, he graduated in like May 88 and then was returning home and then he was going to get married like that fall. So that's the time frame. That's the time frame in 1988. So, no cell phones. <laughs> yeah, yes. So, is the sequel about more murders or just more about the murders that occurred during that? Because this was in 23. Right, which is interesting. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I read a little bit about the sequel when I was looking up this because I had wanted to see, it. oh, are they optioning it into a movie? That's in talks, but no one has bought the publishing rights uh, for a movie yet um, or TV series. I think it's supposed to be more about the people who were involved and how they couldn't let go of the case. So I don't think there's any murders in the sequel, but it's more of the after effects, the psychological toll. But I'm unsure. Maybe there will be. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't know if you're next. I'm sorry. <laughs> Kathy, you're next. Okay. <laughs> Bring that microphone down. <laughs> um, so I'm Kathy Yuley. I've been a resident of Genesee County and Wyoming County my whole life. Um, I've worked at schools, I've worked at business, I've worked at Lab Insulator, in the office, I've worked at uh, Alexander School, and uh, my last job was at Genesee Justice under the Sheriff's Office for um, victim assistance and pretrial release, and I was the director when I retired um, a couple years ago. So um, I've always been a reader, Sam knows that from school, and because uh, her I worked at Alexander School when she was a student there, and her sister and my daughter were very good friends. So, um, I've always enjoyed the Richmond Reads and the Tale for Three Counties, those books, because they always brought maybe uh, a book that I wouldn't pick, you know, uh, something of a different genre to read. And I've always loved getting into those books. So, um, so I was very glad when uh, Samantha contacted me about this, and the book I picked was The Librarian Spy. Um, I had finished The Escape Artist, which is going to be discussed in a few weeks, um, which is a nonfiction book about um, a man who escaped from Auschwitz. And I've always kind of been interested in World War II and the Holocaust and things like that. Um, and this book especially hit home with me because it also, there are two women in major characters in this book. And one is in Lyon, France. And I have a daughter who resides in Paris. Um, her and her husband have two little granddaughters in Paris. So I've been there several times. And um, it really brings that danger of the Holocaust and what people were living through and the deprivation that was going on in France during World War II. So it's uh, The Librarian Spy by uh, Madeline Martin. And she's an internationally acclaimed author of historical fiction. This is historical fiction, but we learn a lot along the way about what was going on with women working uh, for the resistance, working um, in spy-type uh, jobs during World War II. So um, the book actually starts in Washington, D.C. in uh, 1943, and this Ava Harper she loves old books. She works in the rare book room at the Library of Congress. And one day she gets a call that the Librarian of Congress wants to meet with her. And that he has something that he, an opportunity that would suit her. And she wonders how this could be possible because she loves the old books. She, every book is, is like a, 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 has a story and she feels like they're her children. So she doesn't feel like there's a, there's a job that would be better. But she meets with this man, and he's very impressed that she knows German and French, and that she's also had experience in microfilming. So he says, your government needs you. And that's how Ava travels to Lisbon, Portugal, to become part of an international committee for the acquisition of foreign publications for the Office of Strategic Services. So she's part of a covert operation to obtain information from newspapers and periodicals, microfilm them, and send them back to the United States so the United States has information on what's going on in Europe during the war. 
Now at the same time in Lyon, France, um, Helene Bellinger, she's alarmed because her husband Joseph is not, has not returned to their apartment. And she's had an argument going back and forth with him because she, she feels it's important to join the resistance. And he adamantly refuses to have her join the resistance. He doesn't want her any part of that movement. So she goes to the family's apartment to look for Joseph and he's not there. But while she's there, a woman, Claudine, um, knocks on the door and is frantically looking for a Pierre to give her some forged identification papers. Now, Helene has no idea who this Pierre is. And she is so moved by her story about the Jews being moved and the, the uh, roundup that is going place in France, she, without thinking, hands her own identification papers to this Claudine. So it leaves her without any identification papers, and there she is. So the next day, she feels like, well, she's just going to go out, you know, and, and see what she can find out without, you know, putting any attention on herself. So she goes out, of course, she gets stopped by a Nazi officer, and he demands her papers. She has no papers. She's struggling to try to rummage around in her purse to buy some time, not knowing what to say. And Joseph's friend, Etienne, shows up, calling her by, like, she's, she's his wife, and says, um, Elaine, Elaine, you came out without your papers. So Etienne has these papers that are all of um, Helene, but in the name of Elaine instead. So through the, this process, um, Elaine finds out that her husband Joseph is a major part of the resistance. And he is the Pierre that was forging instruments and forging papers. And he forged her paper just in case something happens. So that's how Elaine gets involved in the resistance movement. And um, she, she um, starts working with uh, distributing these periodicals um, in shopping carts. There's a bunch of, of ladies that walk out with their shopping bags that they're going shopping. And underneath them are the, uh, the periodicals that is giving the information out, the resistance ma magazines and uh, newspapers that's giving information out. So it's a very dangerous job that she's got. So I don't want to tell the whole story. Um, but both of these women are in dangerous positions well, throughout the book. Ava going to the, the uh, neutral country of Portugal, she's kind of naive, but Portugal is, even though it's neutral, there is Nazis freely walking around, there's people from the resistance, there's spying going on. Um, so she's in danger as well. So um, it, it, uh, it was, she's alarmed when she sees all the Jewish and other refugees lined up at the American embassy, waiting for papers, waiting to get out of the country. And the, the uh, desperation of these people waiting line after line, day after day, and she feels like she's got to do something to help these people. Um, and so that's, you know, with, with her, that's a major goal, is to use what she's doing to try to help the people get out. And Elaine, of course, in the resistance, has put herself in a very dangerous place. Um, Lyon has a maze of narrow streets and stairways, and they're called tabulis, which are hidden little passageways. And this is true in the streets of, um, of Lyon and the slopes of Croix Rose Hill. And so there's people in and out that are during this, which is really kind of spy-like. and. Um, and it, it's very deceptive of what's going on here. And um, so she, she works with women and men um, that are doing this free resistance work. They're, some of them are, are tense, some of them are brave, some of them are brazen, um, but they're all heroic. And throughout the book, you know, the, the constant lack of food, the constant um, rationing of food and the threat that your family is going to have something happen to them, or that has happened to them, people disappearing. It's, it really hits home as to what France was like during this time. And um, 
I know when I was there, we went to the Army Museum in Paris, um, and it shows the history of the different wars, and especially World War II is very interesting. Seeing World War II from the French perspective is, is a really enlightening thing to see and to follow what was going on in World War I to World War II and how it was all leading up. It's very fascinating if you, know, if you ever get a chance to see that. And I remember seeing when I was there little pamphlets that looked like um, how, to make your, how to make good homemade bread. And it was actually how to blow up a bridge. <laughs> so these things, the resistance people were you know, using all their codes and all that, and the codes are very important in the book too, because they're deciphering these codes, and very intricate. So the women and men that did this, to me, were like so brave and so intelligent to make these codes, break these codes, and so the two women are there um, trying to save people, and eventually one code gets deciphered by the other woman, one code by the other, and they do save this woman and her son. So um, I didn't want to tell the whole story, but there's a lot of other parts of that story that go on. Um, so uh, you know, uh, uh, when you see like the Peace Museum out in Normandy and things like that as well, when you go out to the area of Normandy where the beaches were, um, the people there of France, you know, many times people get a reputation that all the people in France hate the U.S. And, when you go to Normandy and the beaches, they love Americans because they say the Americans save them, and it's a, it's, a, I think it, it just gives you a very good perspective. So, um, I think the chapters in the book, when I was reading it to start with, um, they go back and forth between Ava and then Elaine and Ava and Elaine, and sometimes it was like, wait a minute, I gotta go back to who are they talking about now to get right into it. But then once it got rolling, you know, it was very easy to. To know what was going on. So, um, a couple little quotes that, because I'd like to read, and because this is in a library, uh, in a library, and Ava was a librarian. Um, she is working with a man named James, and they were talking about when they were growing up and different books that they had read, and why they had read the books they read. And James says, perhaps this is the draw of books to show us the way even when we think the path is too dark to see. And I thought that was so apropos for the time that they were going through this. So uh, I really enjoyed the book and I, I think you would too if, um, if you enjoyed learning about the resistance in World War II and, and things like that. So any questions? They talk too long? <laughs> kind of? <laughs> okay, well thank you so much. Okay, well, I have two books, but I'm going to zip right through. Um, so, and I also wanted to say I have copies of all but one of the books um, that will be available for checkout, and they're all available in the system if you'd like to place a hold if you don't get one today. Um, so, again, I'm Samantha. I think most of you know me. Um, so I'm sharing about two very different books today, and I'm going to start with Of Women and Salt by Gabriela Garcia. So Gabriela Garcia is the author of this book. Um, it is her debut book. Her fiction and poems appeared in Best American Poetry, Tin House, Iowa Review, Michigan Quarterly Review, The Cincinnati Review, Black Warrior Review, and elsewhere. Um, she's received many fellowships. Um, many accolades for her work. She has a BA in Sociology from Fordham University and an MFA in Fiction from Purdue, where she also taught creative writing. The daughter of immigrants from Cuba and Mexico, Gabriela was raised in Miami and currently lives in the Bay Area. She is a longtime feminist and migrant justice organizer who has also worked in music and magazines. Um, so this book was a selection for Roxane Gay's aud Audacious Book Club in June 2021. It was a Good Morning America book club pick. It was featured on NPR's Weekend Edition. So I was hearing about it in all of these different places, and it's short, so I was like, I can fit this in, I can read it. Um, you know, your to, to read list is always very long, and you have to prioritize. 
Um, so this was actually developed from her MFA thesis at Purdue. The book is very character centric, revolving around different generations of women, each facing their own challenges. It opens in present day Miami, where Jeanette is recovering from drug addiction and navigating a complicated relationship with her mother, Carmen. After a brief prologue, the reader is taken back to 19th century Cuba, where Jeanette's great-great-great-grandmother Maria Isabel spends her days working in a cigar factory. <coughs> Their stories intersect with revolution, violence, displacement, social injustice, and more. With only 12 chapters and 224 pages, it's a short book, but it conveys a lot. Um, some that have read it kind of um, kind of described it as 12 different short stories. So it really moves along quite quickly once you start, and the chapters are not very long. Um, it is a kind of a gritty read because it's a real it's a real read. Um, she shares about the immigrant experience, uh, what women in particular go through. Um, when they are displaced, um, and those sorts of things. Um, I do have somewhat nefarious reasons for sharing about this book, because it is our May book discussion selection. Da -da -da -da. Um, we'll be discussing it on May 8th and May 10th. Um, if you've never been, we would love to have you. Um, again, it's short, so it won't take you long to read it, and it's very pretty. Um, <laughs> fiction can be a wonderful way to gain a better perspective on worlds that are very different from our own. So my second book, again, just whipping right through here, um, is called How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix. And I didn't anticipate that we would have two horror selections in today's lineup, um, but this really couldn't be any more different. Um, and that book, I didn't also realize how popular it still was, and I couldn't get a copy in, so I just put a picture of the cover on the back of this book. <laughs> And that book is uh, 400 and something pages, so it's a bit of a heftier read. Um, has anyone read anything by Grady Hendrix? Christina? <laughs> anyone else? <laughs> um, so it was published, um, How to Sell a Haunted House was published in January of this year. I chose it um, because horror is not everyone's wheelhouse. Uh, it's not even my wheelhouse. I don't usually read it. Um, but Grady Hendrix has become kind of prolific, and I thought, what's, you know, what's the deal? What's all the buzz about? Um, so Grady is the author of 15 books, including Horror Store, My Best Friend's Exorcism, The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires, The Final Girl Support Group, and his newest, How to Sell a Haunted House. He's an author, a journalist, a public speaker, and a screenwriter. He lives in Manhattan and was one of the founders of the New York Asian Film Festival, though in his author bio he says he's not responsible for the bad parts of the festival and is also not Asian. Um, so his book, Horror Store, is described as the only novel about a haunted Scandinavian furniture store that you'll ever need. Uh, he writes horror and science fiction and also has a podcast called Super Scary Haunted Homeschool. So this book in particular was a January 2023 library read selection and clocks in at 419 pages. The plot revolves around siblings Mark and Louise, who are left to deal with their parents' home after they are tragically killed in a freak car accident. Louise wants nothing more than just to get back to her daughter in California, and Mark seems intent on making everything difficult. Their mother was a puppeteer. So the house is filled to the brim with dolls and puppets who don't seem eager to have their space invaded. One puppet in particular, Pupkin, seems literally hell-bent on keeping anything from changing. Mark and Louise begin to suspect there's something darker behind the death of their parents. The beginning of the book did drag on a bit, but after about 200 pages, and I don't normally give it that long, but I was intrigued, um, it really kicked into high gear and did not slow down until the end. The book plays with the theme that things are not always as they seem, both through the events in the plot and in character development. Hendrix writes horror with deep and dark humor. So I kind of call it pop horror, that's my designation for it. Um, very funny, very culturally relevant. Um, so it's not recommended for this one in particular. If you are scared of dolls or puppets, please do not read this book. Um, but there is enough levity for those who don't normally enjoy horror to read it. 
Um, so there's a lighter side, but it can definitely be intense. And I will definitely be reading more of Hendrix's work after reading this one. Um, I know his book horror store has been optioned for film, I believe. So um, he's pretty popular. Um, and again, I think this book intrigued me enough that I'll be reading more. Um, so any questions about my rapid fire to <laughs> books here? My very, very different um, literary fiction and horror selections today. <laughs> any questions? It's more of a comment, um, specifically about Horror Store. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting because the way that it's formatted the book, it also looks like an Ikea catalog. It is not Ikea. They say, uh, you know, it's a Scandinavian furniture store, but it's basically like an Ikea uh, that's haunted. And um, in, in, the, in the book, it's like, like I said, formatted. I know, like, I almost brought it because yeah. it's so unique. It's in our fiction section, but it looks like a catalog. It looks so. like a catalog, and there's uh, items in it. It, it talks, you know, essentially it's like a, a good, you know, commentary on like consumerism and capitalism, but it's done very, in a funny way, but then it gets really scary. So I think what people like about Brady Hendrix is what you said about like, there's this deep, dark humor, um, but then it goes really dark. So yeah, very dark. It, um, yeah, if it bothers you, it, it wouldn't be a, a good tip. Yeah, specifically, I was telling my aunt, and she was like, oh, I've been wanting to read his books. And I was like, do you have an issue with puppets or dolls? And she's like, yes. And I said, do not. Please do not blame me for the therapy you need afterwards. Um, so those are my reviews. Any other questions, Kathy? Well, this is a comment. Sure. But, um, when you said that about puppets and dolls, um, my husband and I had stayed, we had stayed in a bed, not a bed and breakfast. Uh, Airbnb, yeah, uh, in, in Paris, and I don't know what those people did, but there was a wall of puppets. Uh -oh. There was like an old baby carriage, mm -mm. small baby carriage. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and some of the art was really out there, and I was like, oh, were these in the pictures before you booked it, or? No, oh, I don't think it's handy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I remember taking the pictures and sending them over to the kitchen. Sure. Oh no. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna go there. No. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, so next week we have Julia Garver will be reviewing uh, Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, and the Teachings of Plants by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Um, and just since this is our first day, just a brief overview of the rest of the series, April 19th. Ron Chernowski, he is going to review The Escape Artist, The Man Who Broke Out of Auschwitz to Warn the World by Jonathan Friedland. In our final uh, session on April 26th, um, Reverend Dr. Rula El Khuri and Reverend Dr. Sheila McCullough will review The Last Slave Ship, the true story of how Clotilda was found, her descendants, and an extraordinary reckoning. Um, so that's our 23. 2023 <laughs> spring series. My words are all jumbled here. Um, thank you for coming today. We need to pull our door prize. door prize um, and yeah I think that's all I have thank you again to our friends at the library if you're ever interested in joining the friends they love to have more members we have some membership flyers over here along with some program brochures we've got a lot coming up in April at the library so thank you, thank you. Oh, and thank you Richard for making our coffee he's our coffee man so thank Richard for the coffee <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.